Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 16 on wave motion. On the cover slide you can see we have two examples of wave motion. The first is um, a surfer encountering a wave in the ocean and the second is a slinky spring toy. Perhaps you've seen one of these before and um, they also operate on the principle of uh, waves. Let's have a look then at the at the learning objectives for this chapter. So firstly you should be able to define a wave distinguish between transverse and longitudinal waves. We actually get two kinds of waves. Then we should be able to define a number of different properties uh, of waves, amplitude, wavelength, period, frequency, wave number, angular frequency. If these terms sound uh, familiar, it's because we've covered them in chapter 13, where we laid the foundation for this uh, chapter. So it's not, not entirely new. Know the physical meaning of all the terms contained in an expression for describing a moving wave. Uh, we go on to look at um, the transverse velocity and acceleration of a harmonic wave and derive the expression for the speed of a wave in a stretched spring. And then we go on to look at boundary conditions, which deals with if you have a wave, for example, traveling on a, sp a string, what would happen when it gets to the end of that spring? Uh, string to the boundary uh, interfaces and we derive an expression that exp uh, that predicts the rate of energy transfer by harmonic wave in a string and of course going on to solve problems uh, on each of these these topics we move on then to the definition of waves a wave is the transfer of energy through space without the company and transfer of matter uh, you get two different mechanisms whereby waves can propagate. The first is a mechanical wave and the second is electromagnetic uh, radiation. A mechanical wave would refer to some mechanical process such as uh, a wave in a, on a string or the uh, ocean wave behind me. That would be examples of mechanical waves. Whereas electromagnetic waves would be examples of that might be cell phone signals or uh, indeed light. But in this course we're going to focus mainly on mechanical waves. All mechanical waves uh, require some source of disturbance, that's the origin at which the, the wave is created. Um, it requires some medium um, containing elements that can be disturbed. Remember a wave deals with the transfer of energy through space. But the second point says that we also need uh, elements that, that can be disturbed. So, for example, in the, in the sea example, the, 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 the sea waves, the medium would be the sea water, right? And then some physical mechanism through which the elements of the media can influence uh, one another. In the ocean, all the little water waves are in contact with one another. So, as they move, they're able to to move together and create uh, waves. If we look uh, in general at electromagnetic waves, you find that there's actually this large uh, spectrum um, starting at uh, radio waves, which have a long wavelength or low frequency, and moving up to high, um, to very high frequency or small wavelengths of, of gamma radiation in X-rays. And the, the, there's also a visible part of the spectrum, that's this region shown here. This is, you know, the light that we, we see around us. Everything we see falls within the visible uh, region of the spectrum. We said that we're going to be dealing with two types of mechanical waves, uh, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. The definition then of a transverse wave is a wave or, or pulse that causes the elements of the disturbed medium to move perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. So if you look at this example of a transverse wave, what we have is we have a person holding a string or a rope and the rope is attached to a wall and the person is shaking this rope or moving their hand up and down and because of that we see what happens is a wave or a pulse moves along the the length of the string you can see the the direction of movement of the pulse is from 
uh, left to right. Here the pulse is near the end of the string which is attached to um, the wall. But if we look at what happens to each of the individual elements of, of the pieces of string, if we look at just one little piece of string or one point P, then you can see that this little point is, is uh, it's going to be moving up. And then as the wave passes, it's going to move back down. So we have this case where the wave is moving from left to right, but each element of the media, each little piece of string is moving up and down. So the movement is perpendicular to, to each other. For the definition of longitudinal waves, on the other hand, we have a wave or pulse that causes the elements of the media to move parallel to the direction of the propagation. is called a longitudinal wave. That's the definition of a longitudinal wave. An example of this is sound waves moving through an air media. If we look at the explanation or the example here, we have a person um, moving a, a spring. And in this case, the, the motion of their hand is the hand moves forwards and backwards. And this creates a longitudinal pulse. What happens is we have a pulse that travels along the length of the, of the um, spring from left to right. But as the pulse propagates, each element of the spring, it simply moves uh, to and fro. So the motion of the elements is parallel to the motion of the wave. It says here, as the pulse passes by, the displacement of the coils is parallel to the direction of propagation. We find that in nature, you can actually have a combination of these two waves. So for example, if you have water waves in an ocean, then it says here, some waves in nature exhibit a combination of transverse and longitudinal displacement. When a water wave travels on a surface of deep water, elements of water at the surface move in a near circular path. So here you can see each little drop of water is moving in a kind of circular path. And the disturbance has both uh, longitudinal and transverse uh, components. In, uh, for, the, for the case of our course though and our uh, waves we're considering, we're going to consider either pure uh, longitudinal or pure transverse uh, waves. We go on then to look at the mathematical description or modeling of waves. Um, here we have uh, a wave and uh, the, the height y is expressed as a function of the distance x. And you can see we have a wave that's following a sine shape. And we mathematically describe this wave as y is equal to a sine of kx minus omega t plus phi. I encourage you at this point to just look over chapter 13 again. The work that we do now builds on chapter 13. When the wave is moving to the right, it has a phase given by kx minus omega t plus phi. Note this term here is minus. So this is to say that, that this wave would be moving to the right. Uh, but when a wave is moving to the left, it would have um, uh, a phase of, of the type kx plus omega t plus phi. So from the sign of the, of the um, omega t term, you can tell if the wave is moving to the left or to the right. If it's negative, the, the wave is moving to the right. If it's positive, it's moving to the left. This is something super important for you to, to remember and to take note of. Um, the maximum position of an element uh, of the media rel relative to its equilibrium position is called the amplitude. Here, this is the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position at zero. This is the amplitude, the A term. This is also something we've already seen and spoken about, the amplitude A term. I would like you to, to take note that um, sine and cos, they, you know, very closely related. If you shift a sine wave by 90 degrees, you're able to get a cos wave. And for this reason, you might also encounter uh, traveling waves written in the form A cos of kx minus omega t 
plus phi. So, so don't become confused if the sign is replaced by cos. The, the analysis and the, the interpretation of what we're doing is, is very, very uh, similar. If we go on to, to, to look at the wave and we consider again the y position, but this time as a function of time, then the period is defined as shown. The period of a wave is the time interval required for the element to complete one full cycle of oscillation and for the wave to travel one wavelength. So here you can see one full cycle starting at this point, going down and returning to uh, that point again, one complete cycle. The time taken for that is, is the period. When we speak about the frequency, the frequency is the inverse of the period. So if you know the period, you, you go one over the period to give you the, the frequency. And the frequency is the number of crests or troughs um, or any other given point of the wave that pass a given point in a unit uh, time interval. Remember, frequency has units of per second or hertz, whereas uh, the period T will have units of um, seconds. If we look at the, the other term, we've seen, you know, A is the amplitude, um, phi is called the phase constant. It will be the offset. That's something we've already spoken about before. It's a phase constant which uh, offsets the wave, uh, moving, uh, sh sort of shifting it to the right or to the left in, in its relative starting position. Uh, the wave number K, this is... 2 pi over lambda. We call 2 pi over lambda the wave number. Again, something we've seen as well, the angular frequency omega is equal to 2 pi over t or 2 pi frequency. And uh, perhaps some, some, uh, some text might refer to this as the angular velocity. Angular velocity and angular frequency are often used uh, interchangeably to uh, mean the same thing. And then the wave speed, uh, the wave speed, this is the speed at which the wave is moving from left to right. This is given by omega over k. Let's have a look at an example to make this a little bit more concrete. In the example, a sinusoidal wave of frequency f is traveling along a stretched string. The string is brought to rest and a second wave of frequency 2f is established on the string. What is the wave speed of the second wave? Is it A, twice that of the first wave, B, half that of the first wave, C, the same as the, that of the first wave, or impossible to determine? So what the example is speaking about, it's speaking about a person uh, shaking uh, a, um, a string. And initially they're shaking it such that they set up a wave of frequency F in the, in the string. But then what they do is they, they, they stop that and they repeat the experiment and this time they shake it more vigorously and they set up a wave with frequency 2f. And we asked, uh, comparing these two cases, uh, what is the relationship between the velocity in each case going to be? And it turns out that the velocity remains constant. And the reason for this is that the speed of a wave in a material it depends on the properties of the media in which it's propagating in. So the speed of a wave in a certain material will always be constant um, at a given temperature. So if we stay in the same media, the speed remains constant. In our example, the, the wave is moving in the string in both cases. So um, the properties of the string are staying the same and the speed of the wave isn't going to, to change. Examples of that is, you know, that, that, that the speed of sound in um, air at room temperature is 343 meters per second, or the speed of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum, C, is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So the answer to this question is um, C, uh, the same as the first wave, the, the speed, the the speed of the wave in the 
in the first case is the same as the speed of the wave in the in the second case part two of the question asks us um, from the same choices what will happen to the the from the same choices describe the wavelength of the second wave so if we look at the wavelength of the second wave we know what we're doing from the first wave to the second wave we we double in the frequency so we move in from a frequency of f to a frequency of 2f well if the velocity is going to remain the same so if this velocity this side needs to remain v if we change uh, f from f to 2f so we double f that means that we'll have to halve the the wavelength so that when we have a times two times a half those two effects will will cancel out so the frequency will double but the wavelength will half so the answer for that is b for part three of the question we've been asked about the amplitude of the wave um, from the same choices describe the amplitude of the wave so what's going to happen to the amplitude of the wave if we double the frequency and the solution is to this is that a it will remain exactly the same um, you know this is assuming that the string was shaken by the same uh, to the same amplitude by the person so if you increase the the frequency it means that you shaking the 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 string quicker right uh, but the displacement of your hand in moving up and down that determines the amplitude so for number three the answer is c the amplitude will remain the same here is another example a sinusoidal wave traveling in the positive x direction has an amplitude of 15.0 centimeters and a wavelength of 40 centimeters and a frequency of 8 hertz. The vertical position of an element of the media at time t equals to 0 and x equals to 0 is also 15 centimeters. So here you can see the information has been uh, summarized. It has an amplitude of 15 centimeters, that's this quantity here, and it has a wavelength of uh, 40 centimeters, that's this distance here. When they say the vertical position of an element of the media time t equals to zero, so that's at the start of the experiment, and x equals to zero, that's this position here, is also 15 centimeters. You can see that's indicated as 15 centimeters. And then we asked to calculate a number of different quantities. Um, we asked to find the wave number k, we asked to calculate the period t, the angular frequency, and also the speed of the wave. And the way we do that is by using the equations that we've uh, already seen. Of course, it's important for us to remember to convert to SI units, so that's to convert the centimeters to meters. Firstly, to calculate the wave number k, we can do that by using the formula 2 pi over lambda where we're given the wavelength is 40 centimeters and we get a solution of um, 15.7 radians per meter. When we ask to calculate the period, the period is the inverse of the frequency. So the period is 1 over um, 8 hertz. Um, remember hertz is per second. And this gives us a period of 1.25 seconds. So this will take, uh, this means that it will take the wave 1.25 seconds to move through one complete uh, cycle. We asked to calculate the angular frequency, um, omega. Well, the angular frequency is just the frequency multiplied by 2 pi. So we can calculate that to be 50.3 radians per second. And then we also asked to calculate the the speed of the wave and since we know that what the wavelength is and we know what the frequency is we can simply substitute those two uh, values in and find the solution. For part B of the of the problem we asked to determine the phase constant phi and write a general expression for for the wave. 
Well, in tackling this problem, we know that the general expression is going to follow um, this. It's going to be something of the form a sine of kx minus omega t plus phi. Note that I've uh, used here minus omega t because we told that the wave is traveling towards the right. If we had uh, been that the wave was traveling towards the left, we would have used plus omega t. For the second part of the question, when we asked to determine the, the general expression, we've been asked to, you know, include the values of a and k and omega and phi when, when we write this um, answer or when we write out this equation. So if we ask to determine the phase constant phi, then we need to use this expression to solve uh, for phi. So what we are told is that when y is 15 centimeters, or we told that y equals 15 centimeters, when x is equal to zero and t is equals to zero. So we can use this information to calculate phi. I've substituted the value in for y is 15 uh, centimeters. The amplitude a, we've already seen that that's also 15 centimeters. We told when x, it's when x is equals to zero. So I write a zero for x. Also when t is equals to zero. So you can see this, this term here computes to zero. This term here computes to zero. And we can divide each side of the equation by this 15 times 10 to the minus 2. And then what we're given is, uh, well, what we end up with is an equation is is equation of the form 1 is equal to sine of phi. And we've been asked to calculate what uh, phi is. For us to, to, to know what phi is, then we make a little drawing of a sine graph, right? And we see when sine is equal to 1, the angle must be equal to pi over 2 or 90 degrees. So this means that uh, the solution to phi, phi is pi over 2 or, or 90 degrees. The second part of the, of the question where we asked to write a general expression for the wave, we already said that the general expression is going to be in the form y is equal to a sine of kx minus omega t plus phi. Remember, it's the minus because it's moving to the right. Now, we simply need to substitute all the values that we have into the equation. We've seen already that a is uh, 15 times 10 to the minus 2. In the previous uh, uh, part of the problem, part a, we find k is equal to 15.7, omega is uh, 50.3, and we've just found that phi is equal to pi over 2. So substituting all those values and then we arrive at the general expression for the wave function. Next we look at a derivation and this is the derivation for the transverse speed and acceleration of a wave. I'd like you to read through this little block carefully. It says do not confuse the speed v of, of the wave as it propagates along the string with vy, the transverse velocity at a point on the string. The speed v is a constant for a uniform media and vy varies sinusoidally. What this is saying is that there are actually two different kinds of speed for the wave. The one is the speed as the wave moves from uh, say left to right and this is going to depend on the properties of the media. For example, the speed of sound in air will always be 343 3 meters per second at room temperature. The second speed is if you take one individual little point, P, uh, you find that this point is moving up and down as the wave moves. And this is what's referred to as the transverse speed. So what, we, what we're going to be calculating now is the transverse speed, the speed V in the Y direction. And we do that by starting with the, the, um, the expression for the wave. And remember that if we want to, to find a derivative, then we can, or if we want to find a speed, 
we can differentiate a position with respect to time. So this is saying the speed in the y direction is the derivative of y with respect to time where we treat x as a constant. And when we did chapter 13, we dealt with the how to derive, how to differentiate um, um, sine and cos functions. So if we want to differentiate this function, then we know that when you differentiate sine, it becomes a uh, cos. So this is where this cos comes from. But then we need to apply the chain rule and also differentiate this kx minus omega t with respect to t and this is where this extra minus omega comes from similarly when we take the second derivative uh, we arrive at this expression here so this is you know taking differentiating this with respect to time gives us uh, this expression here uh, I'd like you to, to also note that these can assume maximum values. So cos of kx minus omega t. Uh, cos of anything always varies between minus 1 and 1. So it means that the maximum value that, that this the, the vy can um, assume or achieve is omega a. That's because this, this term here is going to be between minus 1 and 1. And similarly, if you look at this expression here, um, you find that the maximum value that can be obtained for the um, transverse acceleration is uh, omega squared a. So I'd like you to just work through this uh, derivation and in particular, make sure that you're able to do the differentiation of of the the sine and the cost functions we take a look now at the derivation for the speed of a wave in a stretched spring and what we're going to do is we're going to derive this uh, expression that the speed of the wave v is equal to the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length of of the string so we've already seen that um, or discussed how the speed of a wave it depends on the physical properties of the media through which it's traveled so we have an example of, of a wave uh, moving to the right uh, as shown here and if we zoom in then you can see that this little arc here this can be approximated as as um, a circle and we given that the tension in the rope is uh, t so this means that there's a force acting on both uh, ends of the rope at an angle t uh, sorry with with magnitude t for the tension and uh, this this little arc of the rope is going to form uh, a part of a circle and the radius of the circle is going to be r here o is the origin of the circle and we have this little angle the delta theta so let's have a look how we're going to to derive the, the um, expression so what we can say is we've already seen the expression for the force the the radial force the centripetal force of a circle this is given by mv squared over r right so it means that the the, the resultant forces is going to be mv squared over r if you look at the two forces acting the one force is tension on this side the other force is, is tension on the other side uh, what we need to do is is to to break each of these into their components you can see this one here is going to have a x component pointing this way and this one's going to have an x component pointing in the opposite direction so we see that the the two x components of of the tension is going to going to cancel out whereas the the y component each is going to contribute a vertical um, component to the force of t sine of theta you can see that by by breaking this um, tension into its x and y components the y component is going to be t sine theta and we have two of them one for this and one for that 
So this means that the, that, that the um, resultant force in this equation here is going to be 2t sine theta, taking the components. You can check for yourself that for very, very small angles like 0 0.00001, 0 0.0002, we have an approximation where the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So um, this is called the small angle approximation. So 2t sine of theta uh, can be approximated as 2t theta. I want you to, to test that for yourself using a calculator. Um, for you know when theta is very very small you'll find that this this relationship holds so on this side of the expression then we have an equation fr is equal to 2t theta we look uh, focus our, our, our energy now on this side of the equation and we see we have the mass so what we do is we define a mass per unit length if that's represented by the unit um, mu, this, the symbol here is called mu. If mu represents the mass per unit length, so we'll have units of kilogram uh, per meter, then the mass is going to be the mass per unit length times the length, right? The length delta s is, is the length of this little piece of rope. That will give us the, an expression for the mass. But we can also write delta S in terms of the radius of the circle. Remember, we have the expression um, an angle. So the angle 2 theta will be equal to the arc length delta S over R. And rearranging that, we can get delta S is equal to R 2 theta. So now we have an expression for, for delta S as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this delta S for delta S. We're going to substitute R2 theta. And then we're going to substitute for, for the mass. We're going to substitute into equation 1. We're going to use the expression for the force. We're also going to substitute that into equation 1. We combine all these pieces of, of information. And what we get is... 2t theta is equal to 2 mass per unit length mu uh, times the radius of the circle theta v squared over r and then many of the the terms uh, cancel out and what we left with is the tension is equal to the mass per unit length to, uh, multiplied by the velocity squared and remember what we wanted to find was the 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 speed of the the wave in the rope so re re rearranging that making v the subject of the equation we find it's equal to the square root of t over mu and we are asked do the symbols agree with your intuition are they what you would expect well the first thing we see is that if the tension increases then uh, the velocity would increase and that is something that we would expect you can imagine for yourself if you have a rope that's uh, very taut and you shake it uh, then the wave will move quickly whereas if the rope is all loose and you shake it you'll have a slow wave moving along the rope we also notice that if the mass per length uh, increases then the speed will decrease this is because the the speed is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass per unit length and this is something also that we would expect because if you have a very heavy rope and you shake it like a very very heavy rope and you shake it then the wave will move slowly along along the rope so the symbols do agree with our intuition you need to work through this uh, derivation carefully on your on your own it is one of the derivations that you you need to know let's take a look at an example uh, problem the problem that we have speaks of an 80 kg hiker. He's trapped on a mountain ledge following a storm. A helicopter rescues the hiker by hovering above him and lowering a cable to him. The mass of the cable is 8 kgs. The length is 15 meters and a sling of mass 70 kgs is attached to the end of the cable. 
The hiker attaches himself to the sling and the helicopter then accelerates upwards. Terrified by hanging from the cable in mid-air, the hiker tries to signal to the pilot by sending an inverse pulse up the cable. The pulse takes 0.25 seconds to travel the length of the cable. <laughs> what is the acceleration of the helicopter, assuming that the tension in the cable is uniform? So here we have a picture of the situation. What we have is a helicopter. It's rescuing the hiker. The hiker is on some kind of uh, a stretcher and he's, uh, the helicopter is now accelerating upwards and this hiker, he gets a, you know, a fright. And then what he does is he shakes on, on this uh, rope and he sends a, a pulse, the shaking sends a pulse up to the people in the helicopter and we asked how, uh, what is acceleration of the helicopter upwards. I've summarized the information that we given. Uh, we told it takes 0.25 seconds for this pulse to travel up to the top. We told that the mass of the cable is um, 8 kgs. We told that the length of the cable is uh, 15 meters. So already a, a sort of an alarm bell should start going off in our head that we can calculate the mass per unit length by dividing these two quantities. We also told that the mass of the hike is 80 kgs and the mass of the sling or the stretcher, this green thing that he's on is 70 uh, kgs. So uh, if we do a, a free body diagram of, of what's happening, we have the forces acting are, are, are the tension um, of, uh, of the string acting upwards T. Then we have the, the mass of the, the haka acting downwards, the mass of the, the sling. The question asks us to, to calculate uh, what is the acceleration of, of the helicopter. And when we see, whenever we ask to calculate the acceleration of something, and um, you know, uh, we should have in, in, in the front of our minds that the two, two, two tools we could use is either equations of motion or Newton's second law, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. And actually to solve this problem, we make use of Newton's second laws, law. So the sum of the forces is the tension in the upward direction minus the mass of the hiker times G minus the mass of the sling times G. And this is going to be equal to the mass of the, you know, the haka and the sling, which is accelerating upwards. So we can then rearrange this expression to, to find out what the uh, acceleration is. And we get the acceleration is equal to the tension divided by the sum of the masses minus G. So if we, we, you know, we are already told what the mass of the hiker is, what the mass of this, um, the sling is, we know what G is. So if we knew what the tension in the rope is, we would be able to solve for this A and we would uh, be, be, be complete with the problem. And the way we find out what the tension in the, in the, in the, in the string is, or the rope is, we use this expression here that you know the velocity of this of the wave in the rope this is going to be equal to the square root of the tension over the uh, mass per unit length so we can find the tension by using this expression the tension just rearranging this we see the tension is equal to v squared times mass per unit length we are able to find the speed of the of the wave v we do that by using the length of the cable and dividing that by the time that it takes for the pulse to, to travel up the cable and we find out that the speed is 60 meters per second so this means that we now know what this v is we also know what the mass is we know what the length is so we can substitute in um, for this t we can substitute this expression here in. So the equation we get then the V, the acceleration is V squared 
mass per unit length divided by the total mass minus g and then we can substitute all the different uh, values in for v we know what what that is we given the mass of the cable we given the length of the cable we given the mass of the of of both the hack and the sling and we know what g is so substituting the values in you can check for yourself that we come to an answer of three meters per second so this was quite a quite a tricky example in that we needed to use newton's second law applying to the acceleration of the helicopter and we also needed to use um, the speed of the 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 wave in the string or the rope to calculate what the tension is and that allowed us then to find the final solution of three meters per second squared so now we have a look at what happens to a wave pulse when it's reflected or transmitted at a boundary so you remember what we were interested in is some rope or string and you shake it on this end and then you have a pulse moving to to this end and the boundary uh, we, we were referring to is this point where the rope is attached to the wall now the rope can be attached in a number of different ways first we consider a rigid attachment this is where this point can't move at all so in this case we have this incoming pulse it hits the hits the 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 boundary point and then according to newton's second law the support or the wall must exert an equal magnitude in opposite direction reaction force on the string so the strings having an upward force on the wall and the walls having a downward force on this on this on the string and this causes the reflected pulse to be inverted upon reflection you can see it's inverted it's now upside down it used to be a hump and now it's a dense as it moves this way so if the boundary condition is such that the attachment is rigid then we get an inverted a pulse we have a second case we can consider and this is where the um, the the rope is loosely attached here we have a little ring and that ring can move up and down and what happens now is when the pulse arrives the, the rope it, it exerts a force upwards as before and this upwards force causes the ring to move up and then the ring moves down and under these conditions we find that the reflected pulse isn't inverted it's the same as the incident pulse so for a loosely attached uh, boundary supported the boundary condition we find that the reflected pulse is not inverted and has the same amplitude as the incoming pulse take a look over the next slide yourself it deals with uh, what will happen if we have an incoming wave in a, sort of a light uh, string and it's attached to a heavier heavier string and we see what happens is um, the the wave some of it uh, continues uh, on in the heavier string whereas uh, some of it is reflected back some of the energy is reflected back what you can see here is that that the intensity of these two waves is, is a lot less than the intensity of the initial wave and also take note of of the of the shapes in this case the reflected wave is inverted right and this wave that's transmitted through it isn't inverted in the second case that's discussed we have the heavier string first with the incident pulse again some of the wave is transmitted and other is reflected and under these conditions neither of them are inverted when we have the heavier heavier wave first so take a look through this example and also read the explanation given and understand what happens at the interface or the boundary between two ropes with different uh, mass per unit length right what we look at now is the rate of energy transfer by wave along the string when we refer to the rate of energy transfer what we're referring to is a power and um, so the kind of example that we're thinking of is if you if you shake the rope up and down right again then you have the wave or the pulse 
and if you have a block attached here then you'll find that this block will move uh, up and down and as it's written here the pulse lifts the block increasing the potential energy of the block earth system so the pulse is doing some work uh, on this uh, block it's transferring some energy and what we want to do is calculate the the rate of transfer of that energy or the power and in fact we want to to show that it's given by this uh, expression here so if we look at the derivation then the the um the derivation considers a rope like this and it says let us look at just a small little element of 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 the rope and what's happening in terms of the kinetic energy associated with this small little element it's an incremental element and we call it dm so a very small increment of of mass if we look at the equation we know that you know the kinetic energy stored in the rope is going to be given by uh, an expression of this form half mv squared so if we were able to know what the velocity is then we would be uh, some way along to calculating the kinetic energy of the small element of rope well we do have a way of calculating the the, the velocity of of the rope the the transverse velocity we do that by taking the derivative so the deriv derivative of this becomes this so this means that we can now take um, this expression for the kinetic energy and remember we aren't uh, working with the whole rope we're just working with some small section so we replace the term m by dm and we say a small contribution of this piece of rope to the kinetic energy is going to be dk and then we have an expression for vy squared and um, once again we know that you know the mass per unit length is going to be given by uh, mu is equal to the mass divided by x so dm this little term here this is going to be given by the mass per unit length times the the small uh, length so we're able to substitute uh, this expression in into equation three and then we give given this expression here this expression tells us that the contribution to the total energy uh, d or the total kinetic energy dk by a small section of string of length dx is given by this expression here um, so far we've just considered a small little um, sections contribution if we want to know what the whole energy of the whole spring string is over one cycle then we need to integrate we need to integrate over one full wavelength so that's what we what we do next we take this this expression here and we integrate it uh, over over one complete cycle so we integrate it from x equal to zero to x equal to lambda this dk um, the other steps we've substituted in here for the the velocity that we saw before so integrating this uh, expression here we um, end up with uh, an equation as as shown and then what we need to do is we need to to take the the limits of the integration so we integrate in between uh, Nought between naught and lambda so we need to take the limits of integration into account and uh, doing that we end up with the, the 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 contribution of the energy being a quarter mu k omega squared a squared thus the the total energy of of the of the wavelength is going to be given by the sum of these two two quarters and this comes out to be a half um, a half mass per unit length omega squared a squared lambda and um, power is equal to energy per unit time 
So the power, we can take this expression and we can divide it by one period, dividing by t. And we know that uh, lambda over t, that's the same as uh, velocity. So this lambda over t term falls away. And the final expression we wanted to, to derive is this. Right, so this then is the equation that we derived. The power is equal to half the mass per unit length times the angular frequency times the amplitude squared times the speed of the wave. I challenge you to work through all the steps in the derivation and see if you can, can follow them. If you aren't able to follow all the steps, don't be too discouraged. This is a fairly hairy uh, derivation. If you doubt that waves actually carry energy, then take a look at this picture. It's shown a, a picture showing an earthquake uh, in Italy. This is a picture before the earthquake. This is a picture after. You can see this tower is the same tower there. But now we take a look at this problem where they say which of the following taken by itself would be most effective in increasing the rate at which energy is transferred by a wave along the string. A reducing the linear mass density of the string by one half. B doubling uh, the wavelength of the wave. C doubling the tension of the string and or D double in the amplitude of the wave. So they're asking doing which of these A, B, C or D would have the biggest effects in increasing the rate at which energy is transferred. So when we uh, deal with um, the rate at which energy is transferred, we're dealing with the power. So let's look at the first example where we are A, uh, reducing the mass per unit um, length by one half. So we're moving from mu equals mu to mu equals a half. So this is the expression that we're looking at. We must remember that this velocity isn't going to change because it depends only on the media. But we note that if we halve uh, mu, then we're going to half the, the power. So in fact, doing A isn't going to help to increase the, the rate at which energy is transferred. It's in fact going to decrease it. If we take a look at option B, what will happen to the power, power when we B double the wavelength of the wave? If we look at that expression, then, you know, just looking at an expression, we don't anywhere explicitly see the wavelength. But the wavelength is actually wrapped up in this term omega. Omega depends on the wavelength. And we can see that by noting that, you know, omega is 2 pi frequency and frequency is V over uh, lambda. So uh, omega is equal to 2 pi velocity over lambda. So if we are to double the wavelength, if we to double lambda, what will happen then? So what we do is we instead of omega squared in our expression, we write 2 lambda v over 2 pi v over lambda squared. And from this, you can see that the power is inversely proportional to lambda squared. We can clearly see that. Here, there's the lambda squared at, at the bottom. So this means that if we increase the, the wavelength, then the power will actually decrease because of this inverse square relationship. Uh, doubling the wavelength will decrease the power. So this means that option B isn't going to be helpful to us in increasing the power either. Option C talks about uh, doubling the tension of the string and we know that the velocity is related to the tension and the mass per unit length according to this expression here. So if we double the tension then we affect in this uh, mu term. So substituting in then for mu equals to um, t over v squared we can see that the power is proportional to t. You can see 
can see here power it's proportional to t so doubling the tension t will double the power the final option we given is uh, what will happen if we double the amplitude of the wave so doubling the amplitude corresponds to doubling a if we double a then we can see that the power is proportional to a squared so doubling a will cause a four times increase in the power so from what we've seen then both c and d will increase the the power c will increase it uh, by a factor of two uh, but d will increase it by a factor of four so this means that option d doubling the amplitude is the best option for what we wanted to achieve uh, it's going to be the most effective in increasing the rate of um, energy transfer of the wave so the answer then is d the final example that we look at is one that might apply to the scenario of for example a guitar a guitar string and the question we asked is um, a taut string for which the mass per unit length is 5 times 10 to the minus 2 kilograms per meter is under tension of 80 newtons so it's strung between the two points and the tension in the string is 80 newtons how much power must be supplied to the string to generate a sinusoidal to generate sinusoidal waves at a frequency of 60 hertz and an amplitude of 6 centimeters so what we can do is we can apply the same equation that we um, have just derived and the information that we are given is that the, the the tension in the string is 80 newtons the mass per unit length is 5 times 10 to the minus 2 kilograms per meter the amplitude is 6 uh, centimeters the frequency is 60 hertz and we asked to calculate the power so the trick in solving this solution is to to note to firstly to use this equation and then secondly to note that this velocity term is going to be given by the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length so that's what we're going to use there for omega we're going to use omega the angular frequency is 2 pi uh, the frequency so then substituting equation 2 and equation 3 into equation 1 we end up with this expression here and then we can simply just substitute the values that we are given in and the answer we come out to get is 512 uh, watts for part b of the question we asked to uh, uh, it's very similar uh, we asked um, what if the string is to transfer energy a rate of 1000 watts what must the required amplitude be if all the parameters are the same so here we are given a power and we asked to calculate an amplitude so to solve the second part of the problem we can use this exact uh, expression number one and just uh, s uh, rearrange it and calculate what the amplitude a is Right, this brings this uh, chapter to an end.